Coming to you from beautiful Monterey, California. And, uh, boy, we had a little rough day out there today. It was a little chilly, and uh, man, the waves were breaking in. And uh, it was calmed down a little bit, but boy, was it cold today. Today, we got Mr. Chuck Lefevre, golfer, entrepreneur, <laughs> winemaker. Man, we talk about, we talk some stories. You come in, you and I hit it off real well right off the bat, you know? We did, we did. Golfing, cars. Yep, we Man. sure did. So what do you got going on nowadays? You got a store up well, I, in uh, Seattle, I, I believe, right? Yep, yeah, we have uh, Esquin Wine and Spirits okay. up there, uh, which has got an uh, online site called madwine.com. And, okay, and we'll put a link to that on there. Oh, yeah, right. that'd be great. Sure. Um, we have 5,400 different wines. Uh, wow. 1200 different spirits holy cow um, and we have beer too we don't we don't ship beer but we have beer as well um we don't have this the kind of beer selection we do with wine and spirits that's, that we're really known for uh as a we started out just as a wine store oh really yeah wow. the store's been around since 1969 it was the first licensed uh private store in washington state when they changed the laws mm. and the the previous owner had it for 28 years and i've had it since which is uh uh 1997 so that would be we're coming up on uh 25 years 97 you took it over yeah wow yeah. Yep. you've seen some yeah you've seen in seattle you've seen a lot of changes in seattle oh too. god yes so pr- prior yeah so you make your own wine also well we only make a, a a couple of wines sure um we have um a, a wine called vita migliori which means better life which is um which is uh dedicated to my grandparents yeah we'll get into that i want to hear about that <laughs> Um, and so, and then we have another wine uh, called uh, Mill and Mine, and that one is named after um, the original uh, business that was in the building that we're in back in the nineteen uh, thirties. Okay, and it was a it was a supply company for mills and mines, mm. and it was, and the company was called Mill and Mine. Perfect. Yeah, so we named the wine after that. So I, I know absolutely, I've been sober for 35 years, so I know absolutely nothing about wines. But people out there that do know about wine, tell me a little bit about what you make. What, what type? I know uh, there's they're, like... They're both, they're both blends. They're Washington wines. They're both blends. The Mill and Mine is fifteen ninety nine, and it's a, it's a Cab Merlot blend. And then the um, the uh, Vita Migliore, it, it varies from vintage to vintage. This particular vintage is 50% Cab and 50% Merlot, mm-hmm. um, and it's nineteen ninety nine, And it's... They're both really good values for the price. So it's like the type of thing that you make wine every year and then you just put it away. And then every uh, well, 10 we, years we make, you release we, some or? No, we make a limited amount oh, I see. of each. Um, I think uh, this year we had 100 cases of the Vita Migliore and and I think we only had 50 cases of the Mill and Mine. Mm. Um, and they, and they're, both, they're both available, but they're also getting close to sold out. Right. They're, they're, good, they're good, pro- good product for the money, good values. Yeah, limited supply. Yep. Good for a collector. Well, they, I, they're drink now wines. They're not really collector oh, I see. ones. Okay. Yeah. You want to you want to take a moment and drink them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, and so you can come back and buy more. <laughs> I had some Vita Migliore last night with my dinner, actually, and it was delicious. Oh, all right. What'd you have it with? <clears throat> I had um, uh, chicken meatballs. Okay. And um, angel hair pasta with angel. a red sauce that my wife made um, before she left town. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I I was eat, I was eating the leftovers. Yeah. I made the meatballs. And the and the pasta, but uh, but the sauce was hers. Oh, perfect! And it was it was very good, actually. Together, you made a perfect we did. meal. We did. It was good. She's running in circles for a little while here, huh? She comes in here also. I know she's a very popular realtor up there. She is. So she's <clears throat> running, chasing her tail, from yeah. what I understand. The next yeah. week or so, uh, she has a different last name than mine. Her name is Christine Sams. Oh, okay. Like, like Sams Club. Right. And, Anybody uh, needs and, real estate up in that area, man. Yeah. She's the one to talk to. She knows she's, everybody. She does, and she's listing two houses up there right now have mercy one of them is 90 miles north of uh, not quite 90 90 miles about 60 or 70 miles north of seattle and the other one is about 60 miles south of seattle wow so she's uh that's what she's doing right now covering some ground covering some ground yeah holy cow so she'll be back in a week or so and yeah she's gonna be back down here we have a place in carmel valley okay uh, at carmel valley ranch Mm. and um and she's gonna be down here back here on thursday night oh i see right right so yep. you're hanging out. You've got a place here and in Seattle. We do. Any other we're, spots around? Or? We're we're in Edmonds, north of Seattle, about 20 miles. Oh, I see. Oh, Ed, Edmonds. Okay. And then and then we have a timeshare in Cabo as well that we go oh, to. Oh, uh, In fact, I just booked that trip. Oh, for nice. June. <laughs> Get to stay there for a month. Uh, well, this is a week. A week one. That's yeah, a, sure. A week. With my, going down with my sister and her husband and my oh, nice. my daughter and her husband. We. Um, 
uh, we like it down there a lot. We but but we also like to limit how how long we're down there. Kind of I don't know what it is about Mexico, but when I love going down there, the weather's perfect. We get, have some great food, but after about a week or ten days, I feel like I got to go home and wash all my clothes, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> take a good shower. <laughs> yeah, I got a buddy I went to high school with, and yeah, he and his wife been years and years they every year they go down to Cabo they just love it must be something about it. I haven't been down there but it must be something that draws them back over and over again we went down there um it's been now about seven or eight years ago uh, a friend of mine had a timeshare and we we took his week because he couldn't use it oh. and I bought it from him and then uh, and then we when we were down there we went why don't we have one of these <laughs> <laughs> so so we ended up buying a, a, a timeshare at a place called Pueblo Benito Sunset, oh, and it's beautiful. it's fabulous. It's a great resort, and um, and it's one of those things where you know Seattle winters can be pretty cold, Oof. and uh, Monterey Carmel uh, can be pretty cold. It's not the warmest place. In the, it's right. most, I think it's the most beautiful place in the world. Yeah, but it's also not the warmest place in the world. Right, and uh, it does. It is a little overcast here. Yeah, sometimes or, or, a little chill. Sometimes you just need some sunshine. Right. So when we need some sunshine, we go to Cabo. Oh man, to the timeshare down there. So, so we, we are we're we say this to each other all the time. We're blessed. We have sure. we, we have a blessed life. Right, we, we right. really really do. Yeah. Um, so uh, nice, nice to be able to yeah to appreciate that. Yeah, Edmonds is a great little town. It's a it's a ferry town where people come to catch a ferry to oh, go to I the see. other side on the Olympic Peninsula, and mm. it's a cute little walking town in in uh, north of Seattle. Uh, really nice little town. And then living in Carmel Valley, we get a little more sunshine than you do over here on the coast. Mm. Um, and we're six miles away from all the great restaurants and shops in in right. Carmel and the Monterey area. I mean, it's just beautiful. You know, yeah, take, in an hour we can be in Big Sur. How did Edmonds get started? Is that a logging community or was that a fishing community? I think it was a logging community. Probably logging. Yeah, yeah. I think it was logging. One of the trees that are up there. And, and there's a there's a um, a natural bowl mm. that, that's Edmonds, um, and so that you end up with a lot of houses with great views. So we have a we're fortunate. We bought an older house um, that had a great view, 180 degree view of the um, a. Uh, Puget Sound and the Olympic Mountains on the other side. Oh, wow. it, it's a spectacular view. We had to put a lot of money and a lot of work into sure. that house uh, right. to make it work. It's a um, bit of a fixer upper. It was a big fixer upper. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had um, this great view and hardly any windows that mm. showed it. So we had to put a bunch of headers in and beams to to be able to open up that whole the Carry whole house and, and especially the west side of the house. Yeah. Uh, they have a big deck out there, and we created an indoor outdoor space. So we have a a wall that actually collapses, uh, oh. accordions down, and I mean you can uh, right off the kitchen, so you can uh, have great parties. All oh, right, and, I was going to ask you whether you added some square footage to it, but you just added more usable outdoor space, basically in, uh, indoor outdoor space. Right, and um, we um, we finished it just before COVID. So <laughs> we haven't had a lot of parties. We had a couple last year. Right, right. We had, and we had some before it was finished. Yeah, it, was, it, it took us five years to finish the remodel. Oh, did it? Yeah. It yeah. Was, we had oh. carpet. We had contractors at our door at seven a.m. every day for five years, for years. or not every day, but yeah, it seemed, yeah, it seemed right. like it. It, seemed it. Like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it was, uh, man. Like the I movie, know. The Money Pit. Yeah, you never know, again. Just, never uh, again. Time. It's, right. It turned out great, but yeah. never, never again. Right. Well, you got the realtor that'll find you the deals. Yeah, I don't want any more houses. Some assembly required, <laughs> though, huh? Yeah, exactly. Well, she she actually had this house listed and, and took me into it and said, I think we should buy it. And I said, it's got pink carpet and pink Corian countertops. And upstairs, there's even pink wallpaper. Right. I, I, it's not for me. And she's like, <laughs> shut up and look at the view. And then I... I um, she took me out there a second time, and I said, "If we're going to do this, look a second time." I said, "I'm going to bring my um, architect friend out here." Ah, right. And I had a, a guy that I know who's a customer at the store, and I took him out. There. He had done some work for me at the store, and I took him out there to look at it. And, and he went home that was, that was like a Friday. He went home that weekend and drew it all out, um, like um, not on the back of a napkin, but almost, yeah. and said, "This is what you, this is what it can look like." And he presented it to us, and we went. Wow. Wow. Okay. okay. I get it. Now I see it. Right. Yeah, I don't have that kind of vision, but he did. Right. Right. He took it. Yeah. He looked at all your weight bearing walls and this is what you need to get rid of and put this in. And yep. Just, just, uh, cancel the pink carpet out of your mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> see if you can see through that. Exactly. It's not always easy to do. Yeah. It, 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 I couldn't do it, but he, he was able to do right. it when he came up with this uh, accordion wall and the, taking advantage of the view and a whole different kitchen and, 
everything. I mean, it, we literally took the downstairs down to the studs. Wow. And the, including the ceiling. Love that. Including the ceiling. And then upstairs, we didn't have to do quite as much work, but we, we put in a, a master suite that was substantially different. We had to move some walls up there and put in a nice um, master closet. Christine, Christine was, I was, was kept telling me that we needed to put the, um, the, the pantry behind the kitchen. And I said, well, it's already in the back of the kitchen, the, the way it was designed before. And we, talk, we, we went round and round and round about it. And she said, no, behind the kitchen. And I said, it is at the back of the kitchen. <laughs> she said, and finally, she, she convinced me we had an atrium that was behind the kitchen. Ah, and she said, it's a wasted space. We need right. to take that and make it into a pantry. Just one huge. And then the, the architect moved the stairs. Mm. And created a uh, an even bigger space back there. So we have this big pantry, <laughs> and above it, we now have a walk in closet on top of the pantry. Oh, perfect! So, and all that was just an atrium; it was wasted space. Sure, but you had to move the staircase. But you just didn't think about it. No, yeah, right. Yeah, had to move the staircase. Had to move walls. It was it was extensive project. I, yeah, I, I had to move I, staircases I, before. That's no fun. No, so sometimes you got into get into the basement and pour new footings and. You know, that's a whole new weight-bearing system when you're putting a, a new stairway somewhere. You yeah, know. and we um, we lived there the whole time. <laughs> it wasn't like we moved out and let them do that kind of thing. Right, yeah. it wasn't we, wind blowing through it. but <laughs> Yeah, we, we came home one night when they when they were um, uh, doing drywall, and there was so much dust in the house that we had to go rent a hotel room. Right, I mean, right. we just couldn't, we, we could not live there, even though too thick. They, uh, they put this, the... Uh, uh, bisqueen up and all sure. the stuff that they needed to do it, it was just too much so Sneaks anyhow through never uh, again right never again. <laughs> <laughs> tapped out yeah but you got the covid so you got to enjoy it nothing but that house for a while huh you got, kind of got stuck there or did you get out <laughs> we got stuck here oh you got stuck here, here. Oh. At, at the beginning of covid we were down here for four months oh wow <clears throat> and it was great the golf course was closed yeah. we, we were we were walking on the golf course. We rode our bikes on the golf course. Mm. Um, you don't realize how how steep those uh, those trails are for the golf carts. When you, you don't have your golf cart until with you, you ride right? until you ride a, a bicycle on them. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but uh, it, and we, we hiked everywhere around here. We we really explored the area because that's one of the few things you could do. Mm. Um, right. At the time, everything was closed. Mm. I mean, we were, we were like everybody else. We were wearing masks and gloves and. We were, we were disinfecting our groceries in the garage before we brought them into the house. You know, nobody knew what, what um, was safe and what wasn't in the early stages of COVID. You really didn't. Yeah. yeah. Right. We have same thing with uh, to-go food from the restaurants. Sure. Yeah. We literally uh, would take it out of the container in the garage and put it in on a, on a plate and <laughs> throw, throw the containers away. Well, yeah. That, I remember getting that for the first time. It was like, okay, so... Now what do we do? We got we got to open the bag that they came in, so that's no good. Do we have to yeah. clean the surfaces of the to go box and everything? Like, oh, yeah. oh, this is crazy. And then trying to find <laughs> uh, disinfectant wipes. Was right. We were making our own disinfectant wipes. I, was, yeah. I got alcohol at the store right. and 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 ones that weren't um, disinfectant. And we would pour the alcohol into the other wipes and yeah. make them make them disinfectant. Right. That's crazy times. Yeah crazy times i had a business that was closed down for 10 months so i was doing as much as i could to at least help out the businesses that were allowed to be open you know restaurants and that kind of thing sure you know but uh it was a little scary at, begin at the beginning yeah yeah it's crazy our neighbor down here uh, her her family owns some restaurants here in carmel oh yeah and i remember she said oh my sister's dying over there she said I've got a hundred thousand dollars worth of bills and I can't pay them. Mm. I don't know what I'm going to do. This is before the PPP loans sure, and all right, that stuff came right. about, and and all the rescue stuff that came out. Yeah, and she was, you know, they had built a successful um, empire, a business of restaurants, and I had a beautiful home. They just done remodeling it, and all of a sudden they had no income, and uh, and a bunch of bills. So I mean, it was, wow. it was those were scary times. They sure were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm one of the few people that actually benefited business wise from COVID. Everybody's sitting home drinking wine. They're sitting home drinking. And <laughs> our, our delivery business tripled and our oh, I bet. and our uh, shipping business doubled. Right. Yeah, we were already doing both of those, but but they became a huge part of our business. You're just helping For, society just get through it. You're just well, lending a helping hand. Just just <laughs> doing our part. <laughs> oh, that's great. Where'd you we, grow up? I grew up in San Jose. San Jose. Oh, actually, right my, in California, my, yeah, my my um, my dad uh, was in the Navy. So uh, my my mom was a single mom until I was seven. My my biological father had died before I was born. Okay, um, and I, we lived with my uncle and my grandparents. And so um, 
uh, my dad came along and married my mom when I was eight. And he, he adopted me, or when I was seven, rather. Uh, and when I was uh, eight, my sister was born, and we got transferred to the East Coast. So I spent a few years, a couple years in Virginia Beach, a couple years in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and a couple years outside of Washington, D.C., in a place called Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and then we moved back uh, to the San Jose area. Mm. And I, I went to high school in San Jose. Okay. Um, and at, actually in Milpitas. Uh, to at a school that's not there anymore. <laughs> right, it makes you feel old. <laughs> it does. And uh, and then uh, moved to Mar- got got married, had a child, got divorced, moved to Marin County for a few years, and some some guy offered me a job out of the blue uh, in Alaska. Oh wow! And uh, I I said, well, I don't know about going to Alaska, and, and it was twice what I was making plus a company car wow. plus some commission money. Yeah. And I, I went, well, let me call the Chamber of Commerce and see what it's really like up there. <laughs> I, I did that. And then I, a friend knew somebody who lived up there, so I called her. And uh, and I ended up moving to Anchorage. I spent wow. spent 10 years That's up cool. there. I was going to go up there for three years and make a lot of money and come back and either buy, buy a business or a <laughs> sure, house or both. Right. And I went up there and stayed 10 years, came back with a wife and three kids, and no money. A little more than you bargained for, right? <laughs> wasn't quite what no I was expecting. <laughs> wasn't quite what I was expecting. That's all I was going for was the money. And yeah, it didn't even come up with any. <laughs> I know. It's pretty pretty crazy. But but it was during the pipeline boom days. Oh, okay. And uh, a lot pe- of money flying around. Huh? A lot of money and, yeah. and people were having um, trouble hiring people. Mm. So I was able to get into management at a very young age. Because you I, didn't you weren't like a knucklehead or you just right. moved up through the ranks pretty quick and at 24, I was a sales manager. Wow! Um, and uh, and uh, and then I spent a few years up on the pipeline, making mm. the making the quote unquote big pipeline money. Right, right. Uh, and then uh, and then I got married, and uh, there went all that money. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I got another management job, another sales manager job for an airline up there. Up there, okay. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, and then I got a, a big break. I uh, I got recruited to this company called Alaska Commercial Company, which is like. Um, uh, the Hudson Bay Company of Alaska. Mm. Their their stores are all out in the bush, um, not on the roads. You have to fly or barge stuff in. Um, it's a really interesting company. And when I was, we went from um, uh, eleven stores doing, I think, around nine million dollars a year worth of business, to twenty three stores doing fifty five million dollars a year worth of business. In the time I was there, I was there three years. I got promoted and promoted and promoted. Sure, I bet. And it, and it, it. Yeah, it was just growing like a weed. And it, my, the guy who ran the company was was became a mentor. He literally became my mentor. And um, and after three years, I went to him and I said, my wife and I have decided that we want to leave the state of Alaska. We have kids. They're young kids. And we don't want them to go through the school system up here. We want to get them out to a better school system. I don't know where we're going to live, but it's not going to be here. So how about if I give you a like a one year notice so you can find somebody. I had a, I had an unusual job in that I had a lot of different departments working for me and, mm. um, and some of them were pretty unique. Like we were, we would barge stuff. I had the traffic and distribution department. We would barge stuff in, we would air freight stuff in, we would send stuff through the post office. And, and that's not something you, you don't come to the company with that knowledge. You learn it while you're, while you're there. So you I probably I, invented a lot of it. It sounds like if it grew that fast, we did invent a lot of it. Right. Um, we um, <laughs> we actually sent all of our groceries uh, through the post office because wow. it, it cost thirty three cents a pound to ship it to most of the places out in the bush, um, and the post office was charging us eleven cents a pound instead of thirty three cents a pound. And <laughs> so the there mailman was, was hating you. <laughs> well, they were carrying su- oranges and everything else. <laughs> they were subsidizing us. Yeah, it had. Oh, okay. It, so basically, the post office was subsidizing us. Sure. And. Uh, uh, Senator Ted Stevens, who was the big the big dog up there, sure, um, was the head of the postal committee in Washington D.C., and so he made sure that they continued to take that product out to the bush because those are his yeah. constituents out there. Yeah, right. <laughs> those are my voters. <laughs> exactly. Um, so he, well, he, that's a hell of a jump. I mean, that's a couple of hell of a jumps. You went from the oil company to an airline company, and then from there to this. Uh, the retail, the retail, retail. Company. yeah, that's a hell of a job. Um, I, it, that's how Alaska was in those days. Really, you it was just, just go a, from you're like you're working out an oil company, and hey, let, there's a land job of opening, <laughs> land of opportunity, and, and who you know more than what you know. Sure, uh, right. is what it was up there, and it's a small town, 
there was only at the time there's only four hundred thousand people in the whole state. Yeah, and half of them lived in Anchorage. Yeah, and so it, 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 anybody that was anybody in the business community up there knew a lot of people mm, that were in the, right. also in the business yeah. community up there. Well, you and I have talked about you know extensively about you know your high school football and you know and you're hell of a hell of a ball player and. You know, and I was, that I, carries through life, doesn't it? it? You know, I mean, you got to know when to pick up the ball and run with it, man. You do. You, you know? do. And I, I, uh, I give my mother credit for this, but I, I've never been afraid of hard work. There you go. You know, she, right. she, she brought me up to do, quote unquote, do the right thing. Yeah. And don't be afraid to work for it. Right. And, um, and so I did. And you're an Italian kid. Uh, I grew up in a big Italian family. Oh, my, okay. my, my mother's Italian, and and she's the youngest of eleven kids. Okay, right. And I grew up with that with that family. Sure, as, right. She started out, out as a single mom, and I was partially raised by my aunts in, in Sunnydale. Aunts and grandmas. Yeah, and exactly. Everybody that wanted to lend a smacking hand, <laughs> yeah. an helping hand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, in Sunnyvale. Is that what you said? Yeah, I was in yeah, Sunnyvale yeah. at the time. Yeah. Right. So. Before tech. You no, know, there it, we yeah. were. We were down the street from the. Um, uh, Libby's factory. Oh, okay. And uh, at the cannery. Sure. And, and both of my aunts and... had at one time worked at that factory. All oh, right. Of um, course. At the cannery. And and it, but literally, my aunt was across the street from it. One aunt, and we were down the block from it. Yeah. Right. So it was it was, and there were orchards all around us. Sure. There, right. I don't think there were ten thousand people in Sunnyvale at the time. But they all worked there. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> my, most my, of them were my aunt didn't drive, and I would uh, the one aunt that I stayed with most of the time didn't drive, and we would go into uh, San Jose once in a, once a month or so to pay uh, utility bills and stuff. She didn't mail things. She just hand delivered them. And oh, we'd wow. make, we'd make the big trip on the, on the train to San Jose. No it was kidding. A little different in those days. That's the old days, man. I love to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't think uh, San Jose had less than a hundred thousand people. Yeah. And uh, not the million plus that it has now. Right. Right. And there was uh, no such thing as high tech. Oh, heck no. That was high tech. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's cutting edge right there. It was. It was. <laughs> so speaking of your family, I wanted to get back to that. I know your your uh, grandparents came over and I, you named one of your wines. I can't say it in Italian, but a better uh, life. Uh, basically. Vita Migliori. Okay, right. Um, and that means better life in Italian. And we, we dedicated it to them because my grandparents came over in 1901 mm. um, and from Italy. And uh, they ended up, uh, my dad, my grandfather worked in a steel mill in Pittsburgh. Um, the family settled there. And my grandmother uh, stayed home and raised her 11 kids and baked bread that she uh, bartered uh, with the neighbors. She, she was a, the bread baker in the neighborhood. Right. And, um, and as a result of their sacrifice coming over here and working hard, right. um, everybody over here, all their kids got a better life than what they had in Italy. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of us grandkids have an even better life than our than our parents had, right. and it was all as a result of the the better life that um, my grandparents gave us by coming over here. But they consciously made that decision that we're going to do this to make a better life for our you know our heirs that are coming along. And- well, in, in those days, America was the you know the land of promise, and sure. so they they my my grandfather was picking grapes in mm. Italy, and working in a steel mill was hard work, but at least it it gave him a better life than what he had over there. Right. Made him feel like he was making some progress in life. Yeah, you know, and and like you said, made a better life for his kids and grandkids. Right, right. Well, you said that your uh, your mom or your aunts they just raised you to not know anything other than you're going to be successful. You're yeah. going to do well. Yeah, my mom especially. Period. It was Is that the, yeah? Mostly my mom's influence, and and yes, she 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 said I would. You know, you will be successful. Right. Yeah. You, you know, you're you're going to do what it takes to be successful. Right. And she you're taught and, you how to believe in it. And you're going to do the right thing. And you did. And I like to think I did. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So right. Tell me where the golfing came in. That's a whole nother life. Um, when I first got out of college, I dropped out of college uh-huh. um, at, at at nineteen. Okay. And uh, became an assistant pro. I had been working at um, the golf course in San Jose, San Jose Municipal. Oh, here in California. Okay. Yeah. And I I became a um, a, a teaching pro and assistant pro at, at that golf course. That's pretty good golfer in those days. Oh wow, yeah. And, um, and did that for a few years. And then I, I got offered a job to go to Marin County and do the same thing. So I okay. went up there and I, I, uh, uh, fell in with these three brothers, um, the Caveney boys. 
Um, and we we had more fun than any four people are supposed to have in their life <laughs> during those on the golf course. During those three, we played golf. We had parties. <laughs> yeah, just golfing was just part we, of it. Huh? We we rented a house um, in uh, in a place called Los Ranchitos in in uh, Marin County. Um, one acre house, uh, one acre party uh, uh, property with a four bedroom house, and we um, we had a, a swimming pool in the back, a basketball court in the back, and a horse corral behind it. We didn't really use the horse corral, but um, but it was a great party property. So pretty much every Friday and Saturday night, our place was loaded with people, sure. with people bringing beer over and doing whatever, and yeah. and uh, and we just had a great time. Right, and and I was I was working at the golf course at the time. So you got a couple of years on me. So that must have been about in the seventies, or that would have been in the early seventies. Early seventies, right? Early seventies. Yep. Your disco hair and your big old bell bottoms going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had I had all that. I had all I had, that. Yeah, I don't remember what they're called, but you know, John Travolta had this 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 the suit with the you know the pants matched the top and they had oh, the bell bottoms. That's funny. Uh, I had one of those outfits. Yeah, leisure suit. Leisure suit. Right? Thank you. Yeah, leisure suit. I had a leisure. I had a, a, a great denim leisure suit, and uh, and they had. A big flared collar uh, shirts denim. underneath it. That's great. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> big old massive collars. Yeah, and we, we were we were living the life. We were right, living the right. life. So yeah, like, how, how, so how, how'd you do in golf? You heck of a golfer. Obviously, you're assistant pro there. Yeah, I was. I was a good golfer back in those days, yeah. and I, I shot pretty close to par most most times. Wow. Uh, but um, I went to Alaska for ten years. And and that will oh that's yeah not that's a, a lot down of golf courses <laughs> yeah. up there huh? there's a couple of golf courses but the the season runs from Fourth of July I see uh, sure it, until um, Labor Day that's yeah. the whole that's the whole golf season right and the first few weeks of that the courses are pretty rough yeah there was a military course up there that was nicely it was a nice golf course it was laid out by uh, I think Robert Trent Jones it was actually oh I see it was actually a, a, a good layout and a nice course but it just wasn't open very long so mm-hmm. so you know you I'm lucky to play a half a dozen times a year oh right exactly and so my golf game went from you know I went from a two handicap to an eight handicap um, pretty quickly and then when I came back to Seattle I got it back down to a five or six um, and I played most of my life at a five or six and and don't I wish I could play anywhere close to that now? I can't. Yeah, right. I can't. Right. You can get par, man. I'm happy. I got. Yeah, I got. I got to be uh, 55, and my and all of a sudden, my uh, my handicaps started going up. I don't, <laughs> every year, every year it went up a little bit. <laughs> well, you got to expect it. Yeah. You, you always go. I, I used to hit at this, you know. Yeah, exactly. I had my glory days. Well, and I can't relate to these new young guys. You know, when I was a pretty good golfer, I would hit it maybe 260 off the tee. Mm. And I was watching a tournament the other day, and these guys are hitting it 350 plus. Wow. It's a whole different world yeah. that these guys are playing in. I, 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 and all of them, not just some of them. I mean, they're all yeah. hitting it a mile. Yeah. So I, I, can't, I can't relate. I was yeah. watching the, the kid from Chile, and it's like he seemed like he was, gonna, he was birdie in almost every hole. Amazing, it, because it, he's hitting the driver so hard, huh? Yeah, they sit and wedge into every green and and uh. and uh, getting it close, and then and then making the putts. I mean, yeah, really, really good golfers. Yeah, that's a whole different I, world. I, I, I was never a competitive golfer. I mean, I was good, but I I never played in tournaments. You know, oh, like professional sure. tournaments. Right. I didn't play in any of those. But you could teach. And... I could teach, and I and I um, I could. Like I said, I could keep it around par right, when I right. went out there. I think the lowest I ever shot was sixty eight, but that was an yeah. easy course and that was that That's didn't amazing. that didn't happen very yeah. often. <laughs> Hold <laughs> well, on that one forever. Yeah, it seemed like I shot seventy three all the time, man. It's just yeah. not not quite par. Sure. That's amazing though. That's still good, you know. It takes a lot to get to that point for sure. Well, when you when you're I was teaching every day. And in fact during the summer months I was teaching six and seven days a week and uh because that's how I made my money. And and when you have a club in your hand every day and you're hitting balls every day, sure. then you then you naturally become pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I was tee to green. I was I was definitely good. Mm. My my um my short game sometimes left a little to be desired. I was sure. not a, I was not a good putter. Yeah. Right. Everybody's got their strong suit, I guess. Exactly. You know, except for a guy like Tiger Woods, he just does everything perfect. Yeah. Uh, now these all these kids nowadays, yeah, they're crazy. the the ones that are playing out there and are really good. It's amazing. Yeah. Top of the top of the top. Crazy. I grew I grew up around golf. I don't know a whole lot about it, but you know, I remember when boy, somebody could hit 300 yards, they were smashing it. Three, well, 310. When Tiger first came out, he was hitting at 300 and he was hitting it 
past everybody. Really? Yeah. Oh, so it's it's been that. It's I thought it was a lot longer. No. Just since like, well, I guess Tigers. Tigers up there. That's a thirty years ago, huh? <laughs> now isn't it? Twenty years. Uh, I, I don't really know how old he is. I think he's probably in his late forties or oh, mid forties. Okay. Yeah, somewhere in there. So it's been a good twenty some years since yeah. he came out. Yeah, time does fly. It wow, does. it does. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to. Uh, I forgot. I asked you one time. What's your, what was your first car? My first car was a fifty-five Oldsmobile. Fifty-five. I was the head fifty-five stuck in my head, but I didn't know there's a Chevy or a... fifty-five Olds. It was a tank. Really? Yeah, I bought it from my uh, the neighbor across the street. <laughs> his name. His name was. You ready for this? What? Abe Lincoln. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, no. it was a Hawaiian guy, and his and his family named him after you know they were happy to be part of the United States, and, right? And they and they named him after Abraham Lincoln. I have to ask, did he give you an honest sale? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he, he did. I, I bought did he? I bought it for fifty bucks. Old honest Dave, that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used, my dad and I used to play golf with him once in a while when I was in high school. He, oh no! He, he liked he liked to play golf. He's pretty good, pretty decent golfer himself. Yeah, I saw you so. pulling in a beautiful new Porsche. How's that compared to the fifty five? We've Look. come a long way in our old in our, in our cars, haven't we? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, no mercy. kidding. Yeah, I have, beautiful car you've got. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm real. It's just it's new to me. It's my yeah, first, yeah. my first Porsche. It's a Macan. It's an okay. SUV. Uh, and I I love it. I, yeah. The seats are more comfortable than any seats I've ever I've ever right. sat in. I have, as you know, I have back issues. Yeah. And um and the there, uh, when I drove down, I've driven three cars from Seattle down to here. You had a BMW before. Three trading, three in right? different cars. A Mercedes. Was it Mercedes? There's two different Mercedes, and then um and then this Porsche. I have a back brace that I wear when I do go on long trips. Um, I I took the back brace off. No kidding. Uh, on this with this car here, uh, halfway through the trip, and mm. I never had a back problem the whole time. Wow! It's the seats are fabulous. Uh, they they don't vibrate. They do give you heat yeah. if you want, and and um, more importantly, they just they just fit my body. It's like yeah, a glove, that's it, huh? like a glove, and they have right. great great lumbar support. Oh man! So I'm I'm real happy with it. That's it's not cool. it's not new. It's a 16. Sure, but I'm happy. Yeah. I'm I love the car. I'm really happy with it. Yeah, tough to find a new one nowadays. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Holy cow. Somebody was telling me, uh, one of my clients was in here, and uh, I don't know who it was, but they were saying that there's a there's a ship that's on fire that, out there. And, and, and it has and it has a lot of Porsches on it. It has a lot of, yeah, real high-end cars on it's it. It's got and Bentleys, and, Bentleys oh, and Porsches. No. Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> uh, it's just going to drive the prices up even higher. Uh, so if you guys had just ordered a Porsche, sorry, it's going to be a couple more years. <laughs> well, there's one, yeah, they interviewed one guy, and he said, I've been waiting a year for it. I had it checked out. I had it made just the way I wanted it. I had every option oh, on right. it. It was $120,000, and uh, and it's on fire. Oh no, that was you that was telling me about that then, yep. wasn't it? Yeah, yep. yeah. Oh man, Holy boy, cow. that that poor, <laughs> that. Uh, I feel sorry for those guys. They're gonna. I'm sure you know the the car sure. uh, manufacturers will take care of them. They'll, they'll remake the right. car, and somebody somebody's insurance will fight over over who's going to pay, whether it's years, the ship, the ship or Porsche or somebody. <laughs> but but um, they'll they'll get the car. So they're just going to have to wait another year. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I was talking to a guy that I met just the other day, and we were talking about cars. And he ordered an Audi SUV, and he's, he has a buddy who owns the dealership around here. And he's the dealer guy called him up and said, hey, your lease is going to be up in a year, and if you don't order it now, you're not going to get one for, until – you won't get one when, you're, when your lease is up. You have to – we're a year out. We're a year on, out. On ordering the cars. On an Audi? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. just about, you know, that's a Volkswagen, you know. That's crazy, isn't it? <clears throat> that's crazy. And that's that's all because of the chip shortage? I, or, I that's uh, what I've heard. <laughs> I don't I don't I'm not an expert in that field, but yeah. But right. uh, it sounds like the, it, the chip shortage is the main the main cause. Yeah. Maybe they're just saying that. I also <laughs> I also heard that um when COVID first hit, all the uh rental car companies stopped ordering cars. Because hmm. they had too many cars already, and people weren't traveling, so they oh. they canceled all their orders and stopped ordering cars. All right, um, and so uh, I think the manufacturers cut back on their production. You know, they stopped ordering the chips and stopped, sure. stopped ordering um, stuff that need they need for producing the cars since no, people weren't buying them. Right, and uh, and then all of a sudden things changed in a hurry, and they're not ready for it. What a, a, another yeah, what a tangled web. You know, you just there's so many avenues you don't think about. Yeah. You know, the, Rental cars. That must have been a huge draw. Oh, it's unbelievable. I took a rental car back to um, the San Jose airport during COVID because mm. we brought a car. I had a friend brought 
we had been renting a car for about a month oh, yeah. and had a friend drive uh, a car down for us from Seattle. And um, I, so I took the, the rental car back to San Jose and I could barely get in the rental car garage because there were so many cars parked in there. Jammed. Huh? It was totally jammed. And really? there were, and when I went to the counter and there was nobody in the rental car, uh, no customers. There was just one person at each of the counters, one employee, and nobody in the in the whole place. It was like a ghost town. It was jam packed. Uh, yeah. And then I took my friend who brought the car down. He was going on to Palm Springs to pick up another car and take it back to Seattle for another friend. I took him to the San Francisco airport and I I went in to use the restroom. When I got up there, and the that was like a ghost town, the whole airport. No kidding. Yeah, this was probably a month into COVID, or maybe maybe oh, six wow. weeks into the the first COVID wave. It yeah, was the whole was, San Francisco crazy, airport. Wasn't it? Whole San Francisco airport. Ghost nobody, town. nobody in it. Just crazy. Yeah, we had a bunch of flights that we bought. Alaska Airlines was having a big sale. We, I think, we bought eleven tickets going back and forth to Seattle. We were planning on. We had our whole spring planned out, and. Uh, and we to go back and forth because they had this great sale, and I paid uh, five hundred and fifty dollars for eleven tickets. So they were averaging like fifty bucks a ticket. So we, we of course we kept buying. Might they as kept, well. Every one of those flights was canceled. Oh, of course, that was during COVID. There was the first wave of COVID. Yeah, no, I bought them before COVID. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. and then and then they ended up canceling every one of those flights. Oh, I thought they were so cheap because nobody was flying. No, it was, yeah, it was they before. just had a they had a big sale and oh, I jumped no kidding. out. Wow. Yeah. I took one I took one plane back to Michigan and it was a monster plane. I was like, why there's only twenty five people on this plane? You know, I was like, well, these are international planes and but we have to keep them in the air. Yeah. You know. It's like, oh, okay. So they didn't want to mothball it. They just you know, just keep it moving, just keep it flying and use it, you know, in the States. But it that's was just a, way too big of a plane for what they were doing. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, it makes some sense, you know. Sure. Me- mechanical things like to be used. Yeah, they don't yeah, like exactly. To be, sit That's idle. what I thought. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You don't want to park that thing. And yeah. Exactly. How do you mothball a monster like that? That's a good process. Just <laughs> keep flying that sucker. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> right. So, how long are you here? Another week, huh? Um, no, we're. I'm. I'm going to hopefully be here for a couple months. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah, my wife's coming back down um, Thursday. She's oh. up there. I think I said listing some houses. Yeah, and then and then um, she's uh, hopefully going to be here with me for a month or two. We'll see. She's she's got a lot of activity going on right now, yeah. more mm-hmm. even more than she usually has. So she may have to fly back and forth a little bit. Oh and, yeah, and I may go back with her at some point. Right, right. Yeah, last time you were in here, you were uh, a little bit stressed out because you had some people breaking into your store. Yeah, it was. Did a, you ever get that thing? It was a pretty straight now. There pretty, two in a row. Huh? Yeah, it was a pretty wild. A uh, couple of weeks in in a two week period or less than two week period, we had two break ins. Uh, we had a little lapse in our in our security system that we a hole in the system and we plugged that so they can't get in again. Right. Uh, and then we had changed security uh, monitoring companies and and they didn't program the security system correctly. So it it went off, but it, d- it didn't look like anybody was in the store. So we. Dispatched the police. The police went and looked. The building was, you know, there wasn't a siren going off. There was, um, the doors were all secure. So we thought, no big deal. Mm. And then it happened again. And we said, hmm, this is weird. So my my daughter who runs the store went to the security tapes and, and she saw a couple guys in the store. Mm. Uh, fortunately, they didn't wipe us out. They were there for six minutes and they got some product for sure. Sure. Um, but, um, but it could have been a lot worse. Yeah. So we got that fixed. And then we also have, uh, at the same time, we have people coming through the front door, loading up bags of liquor and walking out the door. And if you um, confront them, they got violent. Oh, while you're open? While we're open. Oh, wow. Bra- brazen theft. Just absolutely brazen theft. Wow. Um, so it got to the point where we had that happen three times. And, uh, and the one time, actually, you know, one of my employees was assaulted. And so... Um, I hired a security guard, so we now sure. we now have an armed guard at the store, which is which is terrible. But terrible, uh, right? We have no choice right now but to yeah, do that. Exactly. Is that a, a bad little area or something? Seems like it's outside the city. And... Seattle's a bad little area right yeah, now. The right. whole town. The whole town. Um, is it? I talked to uh, an assistant police chief who will remain nameless. Sure. He's a customer at the store. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said that they have a commitment from the new mayor to clean up the streets of Seattle. Do they? Yeah, as far as like the I mean, homeless, there's and... there's tents everywhere in town. Yeah, it's it's not 
it doesn't feel safe. And the fact is, I don't think it is safe yeah. in most parts of the city. So they, they're, they're going to get their arms around it. what They're committed to do that. Right. And our neighborhood is one of those neighborhoods where we have a lot of the homeless camped out. There are <clears throat> uh, alleys and, uh, and roads that are not used very much okay. uh, behind the main roads. And, and there's tents everywhere and there's that just camp becomes theirs, huh? Campers everywhere. And they've taken over. Oh, the campers too, right? No, they yeah, just they pull right back in there yep. and live. They, they're literally living. There's a, there's a huge homeless population living in our neighborhood. And because of that, um, uh, that we have, we have the crime that we have. And I've heard from our landlord that, uh, who, who owns m- multiple buildings in the same neighborhood that it's happening all over the neighborhood. It's not mm. just, it's not just us. Yeah. It's terrible. Well, you know, I started this program because of this, just, just such a gap in, you know, manufacturing in America and, you know, what's next is uh, just what's next for us blue collar, us middle class people, you know, and I know it's, it's hard for a guy like you that came up and, you know, just knew nothing but trying to get successful, you know, and, and, and you look out at this sea of homeless people yeah. It's like, what do you, I know you got to be compassionate on one side and on the other end, you're angry. And it's like, but what is the answer? It's just like, that's, well, we, we can't get people to come to work for us. See, at, right. And the minimum wage in Seattle, just, uh, this will surprise some people is now, um, 16, 67 an hour. You can go to work at McDonald's for almost 17 bucks an hour and they can't get people to come to work for them. And we can't get people to come to work for us at, and we pay a higher wa- wage than that. So um, I, it seems to me the way to get the people off the street is to get them to go to work. Right. And if they if they come to work, um, then they can get themselves up off the street, and the jobs are available for them They're to available. say they, for them to say we can't get jobs is is not the truth. Yeah. You know. It, right. It's just it, it's just crazy. It's just how do you get the ball rolling? I, you know. I I've often thought. You know, because our neighborhood has attract had attracted homelessness, um, not to the degree it is now, but it's it's had some homeless issues for uh, twenty years plus. Oh, in the years past, sure. yeah, it has, but not as bad, not like it is now. Mm. It's not well, that's the point where it's unsafe. But I've right. often thought, well, how do you how do you clean this up? I don't have the answer to that. I, I there's there's but there's got to be an answer. I don't know what the answer is, but it's, there's got to be an answer. Yeah, right. If you go to Carmel, there's no homeless. No. You go to Edmonds, where I live up north, there's no homeless. Right, right. You go to Seattle, they're everywhere. That's where they are. So I I don't know the I don't know why. I don't know why it's there and not other places. I don't know what Carmel and Edmonds are doing differently than Seattle. But uh, Seattle has to do something different than what they're doing. Yeah. To the point where they're just walking right in and walking out with your stuff. Yeah. In your store while you're it, just open. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a middle class kid, very right, much lower. Right. Mid, and you start off lower middle class, and my dad was in sure, the navy. Right. You know, lo, lower middle class kid that worked my way up, earned earned what every penny I've got, um, and and it's not fair for them to take it from me. Just That's kind of they, what I was alluding to. It's like you just don't know anything but trying to better yourself, and it's like the anger, like that's not fair. Well, I find myself saying stuff that I never would have said before, yeah. you know, like, like, you know, go ahead and shoot them. I don't care. But I, I do care. <laughs> you don't and mean that. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't mean that, to... but I say that because they're pissing me off. Right. They're, they're, it's one of those things where it's not right for them, them to just think they can come in and take any of my stuff that they want. Right. It's my stuff. And right. I earned, I earned every penny of that. You betcha. Uh, you know, I didn't, right. nobody gave me that. There's a disconnect there. They think that you're just this, this box store. Yeah. You know? They can't think that. There's got to be somebody at the top that owns this thing, or they just don't think that far. I don't know. I was talking it's to— frustrating. But before I came here, I had a conversation with another store owner, another liquor store owner mm-hmm. in Seattle, and uh, I asked him about problems. And he said, well, I did, but I don't have them anymore. And I said, why? And he said, because they took the homeless encampment that was across the street from me, and they moved it. Mm. And got you know they, they kicked him out of that park. And he said, ever since they, they kicked him out of the park, I don't have a problem anymore. Huh. So I, you know, and a lot of the, I know there's mental health issues out there. I know there's drug issues out there and maybe they're stealing the liquor so they can barter, barter it for drugs. I don't know. I, I but, yeah. but it, there is a connection with the crime and the, and the homelessness. Right. The drugs, pharmaceuticals and yep. uh, needles and 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we have training uh, in our neighborhood about how to how to handle dirty needles. Sure. Right. I bet the cops are the cops are offering everybody training. Yeah. Because it's there. They're all over the place. Yeah. You know, growing up in Michigan, there's some, there's a lot of woods up in there, and there's a there's a few areas where all the trees are all in a perfect row, you know, and ask around, well, that was probably part of something like a new deal or something when back when, you know, uh, I don't know, um, Roosevelt depression and, yeah. you know, they trying to get some guys back to work, you know, I don't know if where they paid them in food or what, you know, in credits or what, but you know, there was just a whole program out there of just getting people to work, whether it was, you know, improving our country or planting trees or, you know, cleaning or whatever. It seems like there's an answer for this many people that are not doing anything. Well, we have jobs for them. <laughs> and there's jobs, too, aside from that. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I've often thought that if, if people are going to be on welfare, they should put them to work. That's what I'm thinking. Right. You know, uh, right. And say, you know, we'll, we'll give you the money, but you got to earn it somehow. Sure. You know, go here, go clean the streets. Right. Go clean the park. Let's, you know, let's do something. Put in X amount of hour credits. Yeah. And you, you can get your check or something, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I do realize there are people that aren't capable of working. Sure, Mentally right. ill people, to, we, for example. Yeah. We need to cover them. I'm, I'm good with that. Right. But if somebody's uh, fully capable of working, we shouldn't just hand them a check every week. Yeah. You know, right, they, right. they should go to work. Yeah. Especially if there's jobs available. Hmm. That's just my, you know, but I'm I'm an entrepreneur and I'm the guy, I'm signing checks on the front, not just on the back. Right, and, right. And so I have, I might have a different opinion than a lot of exactly other people. Exactly right. It's hard to get your mind around it to try to help, you know, it's just, uh, just, just pick yourself up and go, man. Yeah. You know? No, I know. Well, <laughs> the you're, world's your oyster, brother. You you're know? you're an entrepreneur as well. So you, yeah. you know how, you know, sure. the angle from which I'm coming. Exactly. Right. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a separate thing. People have. You know, you're a business owner, so you've got it made. Yeah. And we deserve to be able to take whatever you have, and we don't care about the consequences. Well, and they don't. <laughs> people, when people think of business owners, they assume that they're making a lot of money every year. Sure. I've had a lot of years where I haven't made much money. You, you know, I don't. Both, I, I don't have a guaranteed paycheck. <laughs> no. You know, my, my paycheck is dependent on how much money the company makes. Yeah. And some years, COVID years have been great. People are home drinking. Sure, you right. know? So I made, I made good money the last couple of years. Uh, but the year before COVID was a down year for me. I didn't make much money at all. Right. No, and that's, that's the part that people don't understand. Everybody you employed made their money. They did. They all got paid the same amount they, getting paid today. If you get run out of money, it comes out of the big man. That's exactly what, sure. Yeah, right. that's what happens. You know, you know what that's like. You bet. Yeah. Up and down, up and down. It's crazy. I've had too many businesses. We, we also have a wine storage business up there. Oh, okay. Do it, tell. It's a uh, it's basically mini storage for wine. Okay. We have a four thousand square foot room that's got three levels in it. Um, you use the rolling ladders like they have at Home Depot to get to oh. the third to third level. Um, and um, and we have five hundred fifty lockers out there. They vary in size from nine cases up to two hundred and twenty cases. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't have proper wine storage that have collections. Um, they, they can rent, or if they have, they might have a cellar at home, but they buy too much wine, need a place to store it. <laughs> Overstock. Uh, we, we, uh, our room is a giant refrigerator. It's, uh, uh, 55 degrees at all times, but it, you can't just air condition it cause it gets too dry. So you have to have moisture in the air. Our, our temperature is always 55 degrees and our humidity is always between 50 and 75%, which is, those are ideal wine storage conditions. Wow. Um, and we, we have... We never have 550 customers out there, but we have um, 480 or something like that customers. Huh. Um, and uh, and we've had that business since 1998. I've never even heard of that. That's an incredible idea. Um, I we were one of, we were of one of the first ones around the country to do it. Really? Um, I I um, got wind of the idea uh, from somebody else. You know the. I think it's Picasso that said, "Good artists copy, great artists steal." That's right. <laughs> so, I I uh, I stole the idea from somebody else, and uh, another Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it was. But I I went around the country to the facilities that um, had them. In fact, in the, one in the Bay Area um, had it at, at um, uh, what's that great uh, great wine store on the peninsula? They had a storage operation as well. And I uh, the the owner's daughter was extremely helpful to me, gave me all kinds of information and ideas. Um, and, uh, I can't, I can't believe I can't think of the name. Uh, it's very well known. Anyhow, Wine store, yeah. 
Um, anyhow, <laughs> um, we, we put it in in 1998. Um, I, when I say we, I don't have a partner in the store, but I have a partner in the wine storage business. Oh, I see. Um, You're right. And okay. uh, he and I, longtime friends, um, successful real estate guy. And so we, we uh, made a, a deal and, and put that up. And uh, it took us about seven years to make that thing profitable. It's one of those things where it was a slow crawl I see, to yeah. make it profitable. Now it's a nice little business and has been ever since. So the last, uh, the last 15 plus years has been a nice little business. Mm, wow. Yeah, for Christmas, I got Melinda this uh, a wine cooler, like a little refrigerator. Yeah. I think it holds 40 plus bottles. Yep. Something like that. Same idea, you know. She keeps the top rack at 65, and this one at or 60 and 55, or whatever, you know, because one's it, a lot higher than the other and different selections. So I don't know much about it, but so you t- you have a building yes. that does that. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and, so did you find an old building and... and Oh, it's in, it's basically in the back of the store. Oh, okay. Did you so, a big addition or something, or yeah. was it part of the store? No, yeah, it, it was it was an it was an addition. I picture it underground. I don't know why is it. No, why it's, it's, store it's, should be well, underground. Well, if if it wasn't climate controlled, it, it would need to be underground. I but see. That's because, what it is. Because we have the oh, okay. the air conditioning um, system. Um, right. It's a it's a big air conditioning system, sure. as you might imagine. With Keep, a humidor type humidifier sorry, type hooked right through it. Not air conditioning, refrigeration. Right. I keep calling it air conditioning, but it's not. It's a type of, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, it, it, we, like I said, we were one of the first in the country, and now they're they're all over the place. We actually looked at doing them in different different uh, markets because um, we thought it would be a, a, a nice business to have 10 of them, right? Sure. Um, but because it's a real low-volume dollar business, you, you don't you – don't, trade a lot of dollars in that business. Mm. Uh, it's kind of a high margin, low, low dollar business. Sure. Um, it didn't make sense because you would spend half your profits overseeing the operation. If you have to fly to Denver, which is one of the places we were looking at, you have to fly to Denver to, to oversee it once in a while, or your manager quits and you have to go there and run it for a while and hire, and then hire somebody. We kind of figured that managing it remotely would chew up all the profits or mm. half the profits. So it didn't make sense. Yeah. So most of the ones around the country, I think maybe all of them, are independently owned. I see. Well, if you got a place to store it for these big wine buyers, then they'll give it an opportunity to buy more wine. We we Was have that kind of the idea. We or? have that thought too. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> this is on sale. I can store it for you. <laughs> I've got the whole thing covered. We do. We do. Yeah, perfect. And that so, was the idea. Of that, huh? Well, we that was part of it. It was part of the idea. Yeah. yeah. If, right. Uh, right. So, some of the storage operations around the country are independent of the of the retail store, not yeah. part of the retail store. Some yeah. some are. Yeah. In our case, it's it's connected. Yeah. So you wouldn't do that again. Oh, I would do that for you sure would, again. But only on a place that you can manage on site, like local. Yeah. yeah. Right. It'd right. have to be local it to make sense. sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How cool! Wow. You lead a hell of a life, my friend. <laughs> I have, uh, I've had some adventures. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Right, right. Holy and cow. We didn't even talk about my seven kids, 10 grandkids. Yeah, I mean. And four, uh, just had a fourth great grandchild. Wow. So, great grandchild. Yeah. Holy cow. Yep. <laughs> Do tell. So you've got, well, uh, Rick, you've, you've been married before, so you're on a second or? Uh, uh, it's actually my third marriage. Third marriage. Okay. Yeah, I, so. I was married young and divorced young. Okay. And then didn't marry for a long time. No kids with the first one? Yeah, I might have a daughter with the first one. One daughter with the first one? One daughter with the okay. first one. She's the one who's the grandmother of the new baby that was born. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds crazy, your daughter being a grandma. Huh? I know. It's cra- it is crazy because I am I, you know, I just turned 70. I'm not that old. But, right, uh, right. But exactly. I, I'm having kids young and their their kids are having kids young. And yep. so it just kind of worked out that way. Yeah. The new one is called Rico Cinco. <laughs> you he, did tell me about this the, one. Fa- yeah. The father is Rico <laughs> the fourth, and uh, and and it's a tradition that the first boy in their family is named Rico. So he's right. Rico the fifth, and my <laughs> my son in law named him Rico Cinco. <laughs> That'll stick with him for life, and I think it will. <laughs> That's great. Anyhow, so we yeah we uh, uh, Christine has um, three children or, that are now my stepchildren. Okay. Um, they're adults. You know, we, I didn't raise them. Right. Um, and then I have, um, the three children I had with my second wife. Three, right. They're, okay. They're, they're not mine, but I raised them. Sure. You know, I see. Basically adopted. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and did then, you have kids with the second? No. No. Okay. Just three no. of her kids. And then my daughter came to live with us for a while. So we had the Brady bunch <laughs> right. for a while. All girls, by the way. <laughs> 
Oh yeah. And then Christine has perfect. But Christine has two girls and a boy, so there's um, six girls and one and one boy. Nice. It's a little bit of testosterone. A little yeah. Bit. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got a lot of son-in-law, so we're uh, we're I'm protected. That's true. <laughs> that's a lot of kids, man. Too many. Wow. Too many, but that's life. You know, so yeah. So you, you don't predict, you know, who you're going to fall in love with. Yeah. Right. How many grandkids? Ten. Ten grandkids. Ten grandkids. And then four. Some young ones and, and, and sure. a, a fewer adults, and they're having their kids. The whole spectrum. Oh, yeah. Man, that's yeah. a heck of a family reunion. Expensive at Christmas time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and lots of lists, too. Who did I forget, right? Oh, man. Yeah, we, it, it it's complicated. Yeah. For sure. Right. For but we have a great life. You know, we're blessed. We have all these kids. We have all these grandkids. We have right. uh, the two houses, the timeshare in Mexico. Uh, and we're just totally blessed. We yep. we truly are. So. Exciting life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just glad to hear that you that you appreciate it. People are so crazy today, you know. You, well, nice I, to meet somebody that's humble and, you know, had a good life and know you worked for it and, and appreciate what you have. Uh, we, you we, know? we very much appreciate what we right. have. And I'll tell you what brings, brings it home is when you have some health issues. Like I have this chronic back problem, and I've had I've had some major issues with it uh, twice in the last three and a half years. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you get to the point where it's hard to walk for a while, mm. I'm, fortunately I'm past all that right now. And sure. thanks thanks to you and 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 other people that have helped me with that. Good, thank you. Um, but um, it really may it humbles you. you yeah. Know, it makes you appreciate you know that life is life is uh, right. There's no guarantees, and 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 you can't have. I don't care how much money you have, uh, good health is more important. Yeah, right. I'm telling you what, you spend a life of, you know, playing football and oil rigs and swinging a golf club, man, you're going to you're gonna wear that back out a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah. You got to be happy to, you know, it's good pain. Not yeah. Good pain. You know what I mean? Oh, you, I, you brought it on yourself. And I did. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm fortunate. I didn't have any knee problems from the football or oh, I played right eight years and yeah. have any, any knee problems or yeah. anything like that. And I was a running back. So a yeah. lot of running backs have have knee issues. That's for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. And I'm, I'm blessed. Yeah. Like I said, right. We're, Just we're over that back and that hip and be ready to rock and roll. Get you back on the golf course again. Absolutely. I'm ready right to on. go. You just, got, you just got to fix me. That's right. A <laughs> week here and there. And I'll, I'll see you tomorrow night. Get you that. <laughs> get you back to driving 300. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Maybe maybe not. <laughs> 250. Six, six o'clock. I got a tea time on Sunday in my first in eight months, and you got to fix me tomorrow night so that I can do that. Yeah. I'm okay. excited to hear you get back on the course, man. I'm excited. I thought maybe you'd take a little more time off from it. Um, well, I'm, I'm not going to press it hard, yeah. but I've got some friends. Just take it easy. Got friends coming down, and we right. made a tea time, right. and so we're going to oh, go cool. go check it out. Don't hurt yourself. I won't. All right. All right. Have a good night. You too, Rich. <laughs>